Welcome. This is Families and Children. And we're going to continue our conversation with Frank Scaturro, the constitutional attorney from Long Island, who uh, I think we left off uh, telling the audience a little bit about you here on the island. So maybe we should revisit that and go right ahead and do that again. Well, sure, go Sal. Uh, I am a local Nassau County uh, resident. I uh, have okay. been since my uh, family uh, moved to New Hyde Park when I was a year mm -hmm. old. I nourished an interest in history and government from the age of seven and spent much of my life from that point reading everything I could get my hands on uh, when it came to U.S. history. And that uh, fed uh, an interest in government, eventually an interest in the Constitution. I went to uh, Chaminade uh, for high school and Columbia for college, which pre presented an opportunity to work over at President U.S. Grant's tomb, which is just a few blocks away from mm. my dorm. Interesting. That interesting uh, project there I may speak about a little later. Mm. And then subsequently went to uh, law school uh, at Penn and subsequently spent a few years uh, advising businesses uh, as a securities litigator mm -hmm. uh, in a New York firm. And from there went to the Senate Judiciary Committee where I served as a constitutional law counsel and worked on judicial nominations. And then from there went to uh, be a professor, a uh, visiting professor at Hofstra Law School, teaching courses on the Constitution and on the legislative process before pursuing a run for Congress last year. And in, the, in, in between everything, I had an opportunity to write uh, some stuff in the field of history and, mm. and constitutional law. Pretty interesting. You're a busy guy. <laughs> I try. <laughs> you, tra you travel a long way up and down the East Coast, huh? Well, that's good, though. That, that just shows, I guess, everyone that uh, you're well-versed in the Constitution, well-versed in what you do, um, and a lot of experience, which is good. You know, it's good for, for you well, and thanks. for the people of Long Island. Um, I know you said that you worked at uh, the Judicial Committee in Congress. Mm-hmm. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. What, what does that entail? What did you do there? Sure. Well, uh, the Senate, like the House of Representatives, is divided into several committees. They assign uh, legislative matters uh, in different areas to different committees because there's just too much to give to all 100 senators. So the Senate Judiciary Committee is designated to handle a wide range of issues. It actually goes from judicial nominations to antitrust and bankruptcy and criminal issues. My profile included handling judicial nominations and advising on any aspect of constitutional law uh, that arose with respect to legislation. I arrived on the Judiciary Committee at the height of a controversy over nominations to the federal bench. It was a controversy that threatened to shut down the Senate entirely. It was just such an acrimonious really? issue. Uh, that now, was John Roberts, right? This is right before John Roberts' right before. nomination, right. but it was in anticipation of the next Supreme Court vacancy. I mean, the Supreme Court and the federal bench generally has become uh, that much more controversial because it gets involved, in, rightly or wrongly, in so many highly charged issues from uh, the death penalty to abortion to uh, race, and the list goes on. And it's political in, in some ways, right? The, the nominations are... The, the process has, as a result, been highly politicized. And right. I arrived at a time when we had not had a vacancy on the Supreme Court for 11 years, but there were a lot of right. disputes over who would staff the next uh, the court, the level of court right below mm -hmm. the Supreme Court, which is called the Court of Appeals, and it spreads uh, along 12 circuits as they are known in the United States. Uh, many people see circuit judges as backbenchers, as the, being in the on deck circle for the Supreme Court. Oh, wow. So there were controversies not just about the Supreme Court, but about those who might eventually rise to the Supreme Court. Uh, it reached a point that Democrats in the Senate were filibustering nominees. They, the Republicans responded by threatening to kill the filibuster if this continued, and the Democrats responded, well, if you do that, we'll pull every procedural maneuver we can to make life very difficult. Uh, it was a very acrimonious uh, issue. I joined the Senate Judiciary Committee in the middle of that, right. but eventually there were a few senators, a gang of 14 as they were known, seven Democrats and seven Republicans who cobbled together a deal 
to defuse the crisis. But another controversy developed when Justice Sandra Day O'Connor announced her retirement from the court. And you, were the first on, you were on the Judicial Committee yes. representing them at that time. Okay, so yes, yeah, Sandra Day O'Connor. So that was the first time in 11 years that there had been a vacancy on the Supreme Court. And it was inevitable that there, the nomination of her successor would be politically charged. Uh, John Roberts was as perfect, uh, as flawless a nominee as one could want to have for the court. He was mm -hmm. brilliant. He had a great depth of experience and, in every aspect of uh, federal uh, practice that you could imagine, besides uh, being a, a private, uh, very accomplished as a private attorney. By the time he reached the Supreme Court, he had argued more cases before the court than all of the sitting justices combined before they had wow. arrived on the court. Very impressive. And he was also serving at the time as a judge on the D.C. Circuit, which is sometimes unofficially considered the second most prestigious court uh, next to the Supreme really? Court itself. So which, which party was for or against? I mean, which, I know there's maybe bipartisan uh, mm -hmm. uh, support, but where did the opposition come from? What side of the aisle did it come from? The opposition came from the Democratic side uh, right. of the aisle. And it, you do note uh, uh, correctly that the process doesn't have to be partisan. Right. And in fact, it's for not. years, right. you had nominees who were confirmed by an overwhelming margin. Justice Scalia, who some consider maybe the most or one of the most conservative justices on the court, was confirmed by a margin of 98 to nothing. Wow. Uh, but those days are gone. Uh, yeah. We've reached a point that typically the president of one party will nominate a justice who reflects his general views of the Constitution, mm -hmm. and the other party, the opposing party, will oppose the nominee. Now, at this time, uh, Republicans controlled both the White House and the Senate, so President Bush nominated John Roberts. Although it was not set in stone that Republicans would support right. him. I mean, you, right. the Senate has an independent role to play. Mm -hmm. What wound up happening was that the Republicans did support him, and opposition came primarily from Democrats. But at the end of the day, about half of the Democrats did vote for Roberts' confirmation. Amazing. Amazing how mm -hmm. the, our political system works. Huh? Yeah. Uh, maybe sometimes to our detriment at, at times. Oh, in any sure. case, yeah. In any case, that, that seems like a really, you, you were like right there in the grassroots of the, of the mm -hmm. Congress making things happen. That's pretty impressive. It really is. Uh, but now you're back here mm -hmm. on, on Long Island and, and you're practicing law uh, mm -hmm. out here on Long Island. But you were at Hofstra for a while. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the students at Hofstra and what you actually taught them and mm -hmm. how did they, you know, take that knowledge and how did they use it to, you know, understand how our country works? Well, I, I taught uh, at Hofstra in the 2009 to 2010 academic year. I taught four classes. Uh, the lecture course that I taught was called the legislative process, and it went into every aspect of how legislatures work with an emphasis on Congress. Of course, we have 50 state legislatures that have their own interesting stories. New York is particularly interesting and unfortunately has been quite dysfunctional if you ask you know, political scientists, you know, regardless of party. Uh, but you also have legislatures in the townships, uh, on the, the county level in our case, in Nassau. Uh, the class was devoted to exploring every aspect of the legislative process. A lot of it dealt with uh, the Constitution, how the separation of powers takes place, how checks and balances are exerted to prevent one, one branch from becoming too powerful. There was a lot about the relationship between Congress and the President, the relationship between Congress and the Supreme Court. And mm -hmm. students took an interest in this. Uh, they were a very inquisitive uh, bunch. Uh, I know the, the law school itself has wanted to focus more and more uh, in recent years on bringing in faculty that have had practical experience that could impart some practical knowledge to students, not, not just remain in the realm of uh, theory and not right. be, be too academic, even though you're obviously in academia, but give people a sense of the nuts and bolts of the process. So I tried to 
bring into class as much as possible, not only my experiences, which are very limited when you think about it. It's one, one committee for four years uh, of one uh, House of Congress, but stories from our history. When, and when you think about it, everything that we're doing is the history being made. Uh, the three other classes that I taught of, of the four were devoted to constitutional law. And maybe the most interesting one was a seminar called Current Problems in Constitutional Law, where we had nine yeah. students who would act as a Supreme Court. They would consider cases that were actually on the court's docket, and they would simulate judicial conference every week. The justices get together, the nine of them get together to discuss cases that are on their docket. We had the students do the same thing, and their writing course, their grades were based upon opinions that they wrote as justices. They would write either opinions for their own majorities that they would cobble okay. together or dissenting opinions. So they're practicing. So exactly. They're practicing to get to yeah. possibly the Supreme Court. I know it's very prestigious to be on the Supreme Court, and I'm sure every attorney may, may want to get in that position. It's a lifetime job, right, once you get there? It is. <laughs> all, all federal judgeships yeah. are, lifetime, and it's, lifetime some job. would say it's the highest honor a, a lawyer yeah. could get sure. to be on the U.S. Supreme Court. And then there's the other end of lawyers, you know, but we're not going to talk about that <laughs> side, okay? <laughs> we're just not. We talk a lot about that right. on other shows, not this particular mm -hmm. show. Well, that's great that you taught at Hofstra. We have uh, interns from Hofstra University here in New York mm -hmm. that help us with our production. We've actually hired someone from, from uh, Hofstra University. Oh, great. So it's a good university here on Long Island yep. to, to get folks to get into the, their field. You know? um, let's talk a little bit about health care. Mm -hmm. right? um, you have a certain position based on your affiliation. Tell me a little bit about health care in this country and why there's such a opposition to certain kinds of health care. The I know you've heard the Obamacare as sure. opposed to the Republicans, you know, uh, privating, privatizing all of the health care. I honestly don't know which is better or worse, but maybe you have a little opinion on that. Why don't you talk to us about it? Well, that? sure. I, I think the core of the problem is that basic medical decisions are not made by the people who should be making them, by doctors and their patients. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the only area I can think of, or at least the only market that's nearly this size, in which there's such a complete disconnect between decisions that the consumer makes and the price of what the consumer gets, the cost of what the consumer gets. Uh, the health care system we have in this country, in terms of the quality of care, it's the best that we have in the world. The problem is the cost structure is completely out of control and, and indefensible, really. The problem uh, is created in large part because you have large bureaucracies, and in too many cases it's the government that's mm -hmm. making decisions, but sometimes it's large, impersonal, bureaucratic HMOs that are taking these decisions away, medical decisions away from insurance doctors companies. and their patients. Insurance companies. Yeah. Big business is, is doing this, is taking it away from the doctor, I guess. Is that what you're saying? Well, the, the insurance companies? Uh, some uh, HMOs have done that. Right. In some cases, government has done that. They've imposed so many uh, mandates, so many uh, restrictions. Doctors have less autonomy, less control over, their, uh, over what they do. Patients have less control over what they do. And there's not a sense that anyone is paying for it when it comes time to order procedures. There's also about a billion dollars, uh, excuse me, about a hundred uh, uh, million dollars in waste that comes from the practice of so-called defensive medicine where doctors order procedures just to keep the lawyers away. Uh, yes. Our country is the most, I say this as a lawyer, but with some regret, but uh, we're going to be honest here, we're the most litigious society in the developed world. And, 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 and for those of folks of you who don't know what that means, we're very sue happy. Okay? Yes. We like to sue people for the smallest, littlest of reason, which has to be remedied somehow, especially in the um, medical field, the medical mm -hmm. end, because it's making our medicine not even affordable anymore because right. of that. So everybody's trying to protect their you-know-what, right, mm -hmm. in a situation which hurts the patients, the doctors, everywhere, everyone down the line. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, continue. I